gentlemen, welcome to episode 73 of BD's Awesome Guest Panel. And before we introduce tonight's legendary guest star, you can see my voice is actually equivalent because I'm so excited to have this guy on. But, but first, before we introduce this man, let me introduce tonight's special guest co-host, once again returning, and Alad Aladdin fan himself, Mr. Kwame Jacobs. Hey guys, I'm back. Great to have you again, Mr. Kwame. <laughs> now... <laughs> Before I introduce tonight's legendary name, I do want to give a big thank you to the amazing people at Broadway Plus for making this wonderful interview happen. <laughs> you can hear my voice. I'm excited about this. <laughs> now then, time to meet our special guest star. I'm going to tell you a little bit about this man. This is the man in 1992 who, starred, who not only starred in the Disney classic Aladdin, but was also the main villain as well. In addition to that, this man was also the main star of the 1994 sequel, Return of Jafar. <laughs> and of course, not only that, this man is a uh, like decorated actor, Broadway performer, you name it, as he is a three-time Primetime Emmy Award winner and a multi-time Tony Award winner. And before I introduce this guest star tonight, I have to say that I've been a work for his work for many, many years, as you can clearly see. <laughs> Um, now tonight, my guest star at this time is, I can't believe I'm uttering these words, is Mr. Jonathan Jafar Freeman. Jonathan, welcome, sir. How are you today? I'm great. I didn't know I had a middle name. <laughs> um, it's a, you know what? It's one that's very I'm legendary. I'm surprised. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, gotta, I gotta ask you, sir, um, and this is gonna be your typical cliche question, but how did you get your first start into acting as a whole? Take, me, take us there, sir. Well, I grew up in um, Cleveland, Ohio, and um, there was a lot of my my family were great theater goers. They Cleveland was a was a big town. All the national tours of every Broadway show went through Cleveland. Growing up, uh, I mean, in the fifties and the sixties when I was growing up there, and my grandparents and my parents liked to go to the theater, and so they started taking me, and I probably. I think by the time I was 10, I'd already been doing children's theater productions in some place called uh, Children's Theater on the Heights. And there's a regional theater, actually the oldest regional theater in the United States called the Cleveland Playhouse. And I worked there as a kid actor doing American repertory. And I also worked at a theater um, that has been in Cleveland, has been known for uh, many years to be uh, the first regional repertory, uh, first regional all-black repertory company in the United States. It's called the Care, it was originally called Caramu House. And um, I worked there as, as a kid, like they, they did wonderful productions and whenever they'd need like, you know, a white kid who was, you know, of a certain age, it would be me generally because I was hooked up with another theater called the Dobama Theater, and Dobama and the Caramu House worked very closely together. So um, I had a I I just started when I was a kid, and I really liked it. I really enjoyed it, and um, I just never stopped. That's really that's really it. I mean, I I continued to to work at these theaters in Cleveland uh, till I finished graduated from high school, and then I went away to university and I studied acting, and uh, then I put my dog in the car and I drove to New York. Huh. very cool. That's the whole story. I love it, uh, okay. Mr. Jacobs. Do you have a question for Mr. Freeman? Oh yeah, yeah I do. What? <laughs> well, I wanted to ask you was um. Are there any um, any pre-acting methods or warm-ups you would do or recommend to any actor, actor or actress? You mean warming up before a product before a performance? Yeah. Oh well, you know it's a very sort of individual thing. It depends what you it depends what you're doing. You know, in the show. I mean, if you're a dancer, you've got to warm up. You've got to do a full body warm up. I think that's normally what I see the kids doing. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm quite elderly now, so I don't do that. I, I don't have those kinds of I, demands on my body generally. Um, you know, vocally, it's always good to, to warm up. Um, but, you know, if you're doing eight performances a week, if you're doing, a, say, you're doing a Broadway show, and you're doing eight performances a week, it, it's not necessary, especially on a two-show day, to 
do a full warm up sometimes. You I mean there is such a thing as warming up too much, you know, you still have to do eight performances. So you have to know how far you can take yourself in that respect vocally. And other than that, you know, the hardest part is getting enough rest and, um, you know, eating properly when you're doing a show. It's very difficult on an, on an eight performance a week schedule. And, um, you know, when you're working on a film, uh, it's pretty much the same. Um, the great thing about the theater is that it's very regimented. You know, the schedule is always the same. So that's one of the things that's great about it and one of the things that's awful about it. So if you're working on a television series or a film, that kind of regimentation doesn't really exist because every day is different, you know, and they don't necessarily, you don't necessarily do things in sequence. And, but the theater is very regimented and it's very, it can be very tough on people's bodies. There's a big article, in fact, in the New York Times today about that. You should look it up. I think you'd find it interesting uh, just about how things are changing and how, the, you know, like, why must the show go on? You know, there's that expression, the show must go on. But nobody ever, ever asked the question, why must the show go on? <laughs> so there have been a lot of changes in the theater that have happened really since the advent of COVID, I, which is sort of what the article is sort of focused on and implies at the beginning of the article. So that's what I'd say about that. You know, it's a, it's a very personal and individual thing. It depends what you need, what your body needs, what your voice needs, um, and what the, what the character you're about to play requires of you. I see. Oh, characters can be very. De Jafar was a very demanding character, and um, it was it was a great opportunity to get to play a character live that I'd created for animation. But it was getting to be tough, so it was time for me to say bye bye. <laughs> I did I it until January twenty third. I think was my date. It's still the show is still running. It's a great show. There's a great guy playing it right now too. So. If anyone's listening and they want to see the show, it doesn't mean the show is closed. It's still going on. Awesome. And I got to ask you too, Mr. Freeman, because you are an absolute master. Master at uh, tapping in on raw emotion as Jafar. And even though, like, we know that the, the, the powers that Jafar have are fictional, but you have this incredible gift, Mr. Freeman, that you could take a fan of, like, 32 years old and make him feel like a little boy with the acting that you do. And the question I have for you is, if in a role that you're in and you have a thespian or a fellow uh, co-star that comes up to you and say, excuse me, Mr. Freeman, um, this scene requires our particular characters to really like get into a heated uh, argument where y your character has to lash out on my character. And I know it's going to sound very weird to say, but I need you to make me cry in the scene to make it believable. If you were approached with this type of approach, what would you tell this particular uh, co-star? Well, I would say I'll do my job, you do your job. I mean, the crying thing is up to you. You have to find that. It's, you can't expect someone to be able to literally scare you into it. I mean, that's not, first of all, I mean, you know, de depending on what you're doing, uh, if you're doing, a, if you're doing a, a film or a television series and there are multiple takes involved, I mean, you have to be able to do that on your own. You can't really depend on the other actor to actually technically, literally scare you into something. I mean, it'd be wonderful if, if I could do that, you know, but if you had to do say 25 takes of the same scene, <laughs> I think I think you'd have to find it from various places to be able to, to, to get yourself to do that. I know I would in, in order to be able to even, you know, do that. You just have to go, I always say, don't go bigger, go deeper. Oh, okay. And uh, Kwame, before you ask your question, I would say, uh, Mr. Freeman, if you and I did, ever did a scene, I, I would cry for you. I would cry for you on side to make you look like a million bucks. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, yes, it is a group effort, after all. You know, the theater, film, television, it's all uh, so highly collaborative. I think that I think that people often forget that because, you know, the finished product of something is no one ever sets out to make a flop let's put it that way everybody wants their 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 movie their musical their play their television show series whatever to be you know the best thing that they can possibly produce and um i think that you know that having been said you know i think that <laughs> i think i i think that everybody works very hard and and 
there are, as you sure you know, there are hundreds of people that work on all of these projects. I mean, just to produce Aladdin every night at the New Amsterdam Theater on Broadway, it's about 150 people that make it happen. So, you know, the actors walking on stage is probably the least of it. It's what the, the audience sees and uh, what they get the most of, but the quantities of people technicians, stagehands, prop people, makeup people, hair people, dressers, the orchestra, et cetera, et cetera. It, it's really overwhelming. And it's always been overwhelming. I've been in the theater since I was a kid and it's still overwhelming to me to see how many people it takes to put on one performance, you know, a week. It's just, it's, it's kind of phenomenal. And, um, you know, it's good that people don't think about that, frankly, because that's, that's probably what people refer to as the magic of the theater. Well, you know, there is no magic. It's a lot of hard work is what it is. And um, I think that that's something to be considered, you know. Uh, but it's great when people come into the theater and they walk out and they think that they've seen something just sort of like happen in front of, just materialize in front of them and it looks so easy. That's the object, you know. But like, as I say, it's a lot of, it's a lot of hard work. Totally agree. Kwame, mm -hmm. your question? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Do you um on your audition of oh yeah, it's audition on your audition of um Aladdin in nineteen ninety two um do you have any good memories of when it happened back there? Oh, they were all good memories. I actually started working on it in January of nineteen ninety one. I worked on the film for a year and nine months, and uh, this is something that people your age and younger will find it hard to believe but you know there there were no there were no computers there were no cell phones there was no phone patching I couldn't be in New York and uh you know uh, record a scene for people at the Disney studios I physically had to get we all physically had to get on an airplane if we didn't live in LA which I didn't I live in New York City get on an airplane and go out to uh, Los Angeles and usually you were there for anywhere from I don't know, one to five days at a time, and uh, go to the go to uh, Studio B at the corner of Dopey Drive and Goofy Lane, which is a real place, and um, physically stand at a microphone and record in a studio with other actors, just with technicians, just with the directors, with a reader. You know, there's all different stages when you're working on. It's a long again, you know, working on an animated feature then was a very, very long trajectory. I mean, when they brought actors in on the project, generally they had already been working on the project for a, a couple of years, two to three years, doing research and, um, you know, working on the script and working on character stuff. And, you know, there it was a huge quantity of people that work on those animated films. So, um, again, you know, it, there are... I have a year and nine months worth of memories of working on the show, which were, were great. And, and it never went away. I mean, I, you know, Jafar and I have been time traveling together now for about 30 years because it turned into uh, a television series and the first four episodes of the television series turned into the sequel, The Return of Jafar, and there were talking books and board games and there were, you know, uh, video games, ultimately like Kingdom Hearts, and we voiced the, our characters for the Ice Show, and I mean, it just you know it goes on and on and on. It, it went up when a show, especially Disney, just because they they have they do so many other things. I guess um, when you when you work on a project like that, you know, again, you know, nobody nobody knew it was how, what kind of success it was going to have. The directors and writers, Ron Clemens and, and John Musker, were fantastic, and they'd already proven their work to be wonderful. Howard Ashman and Alan Menken were great composer, lyricist team, and then Tim Rice eventually. And, you know, all of it, all of, that's a big ball of wax in the end that ends up being tons and tons of people. But nobody knows. Again, it's, it's always, it's, it's kind of like a big surprise. You know, we're like, well, we have Robin Williams. That's a good thing, you know. Um, uh, 
you know, and I'm, I'm still friendly with um, Linda Larkin, the voice of Jasmine and Scott Wenger, the voice of Aladdin. And until recently, you know, Gilbert passed away, but we, all of us would go to these Comic-Con events together and other special events. And it was a lot of, it was a lot of fun and it continues to be fun. You know, we all have great memories. There's, I don't, I don't really have very many bad memories. You know, I, I, I probably, the, the hardest part for me was just being exhausted at times at the end of a day working in the studio, but it was, you know, it's because I was working. <laughs> it's lucky. See, did, did you have any uh, input on the Jafar character at all? Well, sure. I mean, you know, my audition, the, 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 the audition that I did for them, um, certainly what I did vocally with the character and and, and physically the way I uh, worked on the character, because you, you still sort of physicalize it, you know, in the studio in order to, to get what you want. It sometimes helps a lot to, to physicalize it. Um, and we all had input, you know, again, it's, it's a huge collaborative effort uh, uh, because I'm a, a regular actor and and Gilbert for example started his life as a stand-up and uh, the same thing with Robin you know they have that facility for ad-libbing and making things up and some of it was you know uh golden stuff and they and it's used in the it's in the film some of it so uh, you know so, uh, there might be some things in the movie I mean if I went by it lot went through it line by line now I could probably say oh I yeah that that little that I made that up or but it's, it is fully scripted and it's rewritten and rewritten and rewritten. There's a scene where the, uh, where Jafar hypnotizes the Sultan to steal the diamond from his amulet. And that is an idea that was developed over month, probably over years, but you know, in my time working on it, it took probably six months because it, it was originally like um, a dragon's eye ruby, a tiger's eye topaz, some kind of an emerald. And finally they got to this idea of the diamond and that provoked the diamond and the rough idea. And so they, they made it a very literal thing where he would steal a diamond and you put it in that ridiculous machine that he made Iago, you know, pedal and grind the diamond down to create the sands of time, which appeared in the bottom of a a laboratory glass, which sort of turned into at that moment a, a what do you call them, a crystal ball, where he could actually physically see the the diamond in the rough in the center of that diamond dust storm. Uh, but that was a that so again that was something that happened over time, and uh, I, so I went back into the studio probably five times just to re, just to re-record you know that when the idea finally materialized as a diamond to be specifically a diamond in the rough. Huh. And, uh, Kwame, before you ask your next question, I got to ask uh, Mr. Freeman, uh, did you have a particular favorite uh, line of Jafar? Because there's so many. And after you give yours, I would, if we're per your permission, sir, I would like to pay tribute to you in the fullest, highest degree after this. But I would love to I know. I think they're all great. I mean, the writing is so good. You know, Ron Musker and John Clemens, I mean, they've done a million not a million they've done lots and lots of, of did lots and lots of work for disney over time and they were they were really great at what they did and having the writers also be producers and having them both in the room at the same time was always helpful uh because they would encourage you to you know go all the way to the edge of the cliff and then jump over because as we know when people jump off a cliff in the cartoons they never fall they they're always suspended in air for a minute uh so the the all the writing is great i mean my most abject and humble apologies your majesty is like the one of the greatest lines ever written because it's such a uh it it's it it makes jafar so transparent at that moment what he's really about you know just seeming to be as kind and as nice and as as courtly as he possibly can be but really the truth the truth of it is the opposite is always going on with him. Uh, so, you know, all of those kind of lines, all of those lines where he sort of is 
you oh. know, kissing up to the Sultan were a wonderful lines. And the, and the other stuff, the crazy stuff, the psychotic stuff is just so well written. I mean, I, I can't, I don't really, I can't think of any bad lines for, it's a, it's a pretty, it's a pretty, I would say it's a pretty perfectly crafted, written film. I agree. It was one of my favorites. Yeah, so, and one, I love any scene of Jafar where you just emote, like, because I think is it, because I feel that when you, when you emote as Jafar, can I give you three examples of that, sir? And I, of course, I'm going to say it in, of course, the Freeman style. And I, and I would be yeah, as, sure. Jafar, as Jafar when you go, if you won't bow before Sultan, then you will cower before a sorcerer. And then you go, my second wish, I wish to be the most powerful sorcerer in the world. Like, yeah. I like when you said that, and also when you, when you grabbed the uh, genie by his uh, chin and you go, don't talk back to me, you big blue out. You will do what I order you to do. And well, that's <laughs> since you brought that up, he wasn't <laughs> always blue. You know, in fact, there's a piece of footage that I just recently saw that I forgot about of me at working in the studio with no gray hair and not wearing glasses. And you see... I'm saying to him, you big green lout, and then you, <laughs> I think then you see Ron Clemens walk into the frame, and he taps him in the shoe, he says, oh, for, you know what, we changed, he's not blue anymore, now he's green. I mean, through that, through that period that I was talking about of, of things being changed, I mean, he went through many different colors until they arrived at blue, and I don't, I don't really know why they settled on blue in the end, um, I, it's just, it's just like, it's just the color that they ended up with because of who knows why. I mean, maybe that was, that went along with the palette of the, you know, the, the, the story, the original story of Aladdin, you know, the poignancy of it is, is what the, what is the movie really about? It's really about freedom. It's, you know, that everybody gets their freedom, you know, Aladdin gets his freedom when he te finally tells the truth. The genie gets his freedom finally after, you know, 10,000 years of servitude. And, and, and that is because the, in the original story, the, the Arabian Nights story, traditionally, the genies are always African and they're always slaves to the lamp. It's a very, it's a very heartbreaking, sad part of the film, really. But because it's Disney and because it's such a great story and because it's an, an action adventure movie, uh, if you look at any of the versions of Aladdin, and there are many of them, you know, there, there are many old films. There are um, uh, old silent black and white films. There's a, a film that was made in the 40s. It's called The Thief of Baghdad, of which a lot of the story is, is based on. Um, the genies are always African in the stories, traditionally. And um, it, that, the center of, that is really the core of the of the entire film of the entire story and i think it's why it's such a great story because it's really about something it is it's not really it's not the action adventure part of it is terrific and the magic is terrific you know um but at its at its at its core it's a it's a serious story actually and i think that that's i think that's one of the reasons that the story seems important to people, even if they don't realize it. I mean, there's something really going on there. And it isn't until really the end of the movie when everybody gets their freedom. Jasmine gets to do what she wants to do. Aladdin finally tells the truth. And he, because he's told the truth, finally he gets his freedom. And then the genie, because Aladdin is, decides to step up to the plate and do the right thing, the genie gets his freedom too. I think there's even some line about Jeannie says something at the end of the movie about you don't you don't have to do this al you know another 10 what's another ten thousand years of servitude or something like that and he finally says no genie i wish you free i mean it's just it's a it's a great it's a great ending to a great story and even though it's there throughout the entire story i think it's right at the very end when it's sort of the story proves to be what it really is, which is a great, great fable. Um, it's a great allegory. Totally agree. And I, I'm sorry, Kwame, what was your question? I'm sorry. Also, you know when you were playing as Jafar? Yeah. <laughs> what was it like to play as the bad guy? Was it fun? Oh, yeah, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun because you, because the, the, 
the scale of all of those characters, you know, all of the villains are, are so grand. There's so much there. There's so much to do. The, the, the language is so delicious. Uh, you know, most of the, most, all, really all Disney villains, all villains really in, in every show that I can think of, and they all have a really delicious quality about them. And, you know, as a kid, I was always attracted to those characters, not because they were mean or because they were evil, but I think there's something about the scale of them, the idea that they, you know, they always seem bigger than life. They, I, the Aladdin characters, the, the heroes and the heroines, they always seem kind of boring to me as a kid. I think that the villains always looked like they were having a lot more fun. Yes. Yeah. They always had better clothes. They always looked like they had better food. It always looked like they always had talking pets. Mm. Who doesn't want to pet, you know, as a kid, who doesn't want to pet that can talk? You mm -hmm. know, um, it's just, it's unbelievable uh, what, what, you know, you can, what they can be given. Also, my good friend, Pat Carroll, who just passed away. I mean, look at that character, Ursula. I mean, what a, yeah. what a great, what a great character that is. Mm -hmm. uh, really, yeah. right up there with Maleficent and all the great Disney characters, I think. Villains. Top, at least top five, you know. I yeah. think so, you know, I, you know, I, um, there's just nothing, there's just, there's just nothing, there's nothing not fun about playing a villain, especially a Disney villain, because they're so, they're so well put together. They are, and uh, right. I, I gotta, I gotta ask you, Mr. Freeman, uh, because one thing, I, one of my favorite scenes of all time that you did in, in uh, Aladdin was, of course, how like how smooth the transition was between, like you, how you blend in the voice, like in the snake scene where Jafar turns into a snake, you go, a oh, snake no. am I? And then you blend your voice like to go into say, like, perhaps you like to see how snake-like I can be. Now, right. I, gotta, I gotta ask you, um, uh, confirm this, you did the voice of the snake Jafar and the genie, uh, Jafar in his genie form, or was it somebody else? No, no, the, I did all of that. They they electronically crunched it or something at times, you know, to make the, I mean, at the end when he, he turns into a genie and he, you know, he's commanding the universe to be his and all that, they, you... you know, they put in, they, 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 they electronically crunched my voice in some way. And, uh, and also, you know, the, the, uh, when he's disguised at the beginning of the movie as the beggar. Yeah. Who helps. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah get Aladdin out of prison. I mean, that's me too. Uh, and um, little known fact, that the, in, when I first started recording, they hadn't, they hadn't decided on what they wanted to do with the parrot yet. And um, I was also playing Iago for a while. There's a recording, there's only one recording that I know of that exists on a, a, an album. It's a four disc album. One disc is Mermaid, one disc is uh, Beauty and the Beast, and then two of the discs are Aladdin, and it's called The Music Behind the Magic. It, it doesn't, I think it can be found, you know, by Googling it or something, you know, on, on some website that sells those kinds of things, but it's a really great, it's a, it's a great, um, it's a great, uh, it's very informative, and, uh, it's a great teaching tool for people who teach because you hear Howard Ashman and Alan Menken talking about, you know, what this, what this moment in the, in the script needs and what the song is meant to be. And they kind of talk it out. They kind of say, it needs to be something like, and they, what the song should be is this and that and the other thing. And, um, and then um, the next thing you hear is them singing it at the piano. And then you hear an actor, uh, not necessarily the actor in the film, but another actor like doing a demo of the song. And then you hear the final pro the final products. So you hear this, this, this is very long trajectory, you know, that you, you get to sort of witness, witness in a way, listen, you, you get to hear this, how this sort of, how this song happens. And uh, it, it's just, it's great. Anyway, there's one, there's a, the original song that was written for Jafar was called Humiliate the Boy. Okay. And in that song, 
It's the, I think it's the only recording of me also playing Iago, playing the parrot. And um, it's a, it was a, a different time. They were, they were considering having Iago be more of a, like a little butler, like a, like a little yes man. Uh, and I must say that once they hired Gilbert to play Iago, it made my job a lot easier uh, and a lot more fun too. Huh. And uh, of, co of course, uh, you mentioned earlier Return of Jafar, though, and we want to know more about that. Kwame? Sure. <laughs> I've been holding this question for a while. It's just too funny to think of. <laughs> there's, there's a few parts in the Return of Jafar I absolutely adore, and they just they still get me till this very day. Me too. Well, yeah, my mom likes it too. You know the song Second Rate? <laughs> second Rate. <laughs> yeah, you're only second rate. Yeah, that's a great song. Yeah, there's a part that, um, you know, when he says, Granny's gonna grab ya. That was great. Oh, yeah, Granny's gonna grab ya, yeah. He, he... That part always gets me and my mum. And then <laughs> the next part is when he says, The bigger than the Bible of us! Oh. Was your voice um, electronic as well? You know, when it, you know when he echoes, right? Uh, you mean in, in second rate? Yeah, after the bit when he says, Granny's gonna grab ya, and he's like in his genie form. I don't know. I can't, I can't, I actually can't remember. Sorry, Kwame. I think that it's, okay. uh, it could be, you know, I don't, you know, I mean, like working on any film or TV thing, you know, it's all, it all happens in post-production and it's really, it's not an actor's medium. They use actors, but really it's a director's medium. And so the same thing with animation, you know, I mean, we're just, we're just like another tool that's being used to help produce these, these great movies. I mean, I'm not diminishing our, our part, our uh, our part in it, but you know, we are, really are just a part of the of the of a bigger thing. You know, it's at the time it, Aladdin was mostly hand drawn. They only they were just it was just at the infancy of um, of uh, computer animation stuff, and they had just begun using it. And they I think they used it a couple of times in the film when the they use computer animation when the head of the of the tiger, the cave of the tiger, you know, rises yeah, up. Yeah, Cave of Wonders. Cave of Wonders, yeah. And then also the interior of the Cave of Wonders during the carpet ride to get out during the, when it's exploding. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's very useful for the carpet because, you know, once they, once they put the carpet and the carpet design into the computer, then they can manipulate the image and the design on the carpet would stay to proper scale. I think I'm saying that correctly. If there's maybe there's some mm -hmm. computer nerd that will that's okay. correct that. But I think that's pretty much, you know, but that was sort of the they were using it, they were using commute computer animation in Aladdin just really like they would use a paintbrush or some other, you know, some other technique, uh, animation technique. Um, so it was new, it was very new, and it was very exciting that they were using it. No, I don't, I don't think anybody thought at the time that hand-drawn animation was going to completely disappear, but it did, you know, pretty much. Mm, agreed, and I'm not going to lie, yeah. Mr. Freeman, uh, that last scene where Jafar is destroyed after Yago kicks the lamp, lamp into the lava, though, oh. that scene scared me as a kid, though, like when uh, you, like in this, I feel the aggravation, like as Jafar is screaming now his lamp is destroyed and you see his, his skeleton and you're screaming like in this agony i'm like i felt that like do you have <laughs> any memories of that particular scene when you were shooting you was you had to pretend you're like you're in agony is this in in return of jafar you mean yes yeah when J jafar met his end no Proper. no i don't you know it wasn't it was the return of jafar was not it was not um scheduled the Return of Jafar is actually the first four episodes of the television series. Oh. And the first four episodes of the series were, they felt were so successful that they could package them. Uh, Disney had never done a, I think I'm right about this, I could be wrong, but I think uh, I was told this at the time, Disney had never done a straight-to-video release before. That was the first time. I mean, it, it, uh, Return of Jafar was not in movie theaters. It just went directly to, what was it at the time? VHS, I guess. Yep. Yeah, VHS. Yeah. So, uh, but it was it was because they they looked at the first four episodes of of the series and they thought, oh, this these four episodes pretty much constitute the Return of Jafar and and a, a complete 
a complete piece of their own. And then I think after the fact, they decided to go and put some music in it and they wrote, you're only second rate. And I, cause I seem to remember going back and doing that um, later in the game, but um, I don't know, you know, the timeline is a little murky and I, I if I'd been a, if I'd been a, if I'd been a good record keeper, good diary keeper, it would have been, it would have been very helpful. But I wasn't because we started in ninety January of ninety one. The movie opened, I think, in the fall of ninety two, and then I can't remember at which point we started working on the TV series, and I can't remember at which point, you know. So these things happened you know, gradually over time. And uh, it's probably, it's probably somewhere somebody knows, but I don't, I don't know for sure. I don't have the, I didn't save, so I'm not a saver. So I didn't save my, you know, script, it, we finished the script of the day and just threw it out, you know, and um, not out of, uh, not out of irreverence, but just because, you know, the next day you're going into work, they would have rewritten it anyway. So <laughs> there's just a certain amount of paper one can keep in one's life. <laughs> well, that, that makes a lot of sense. So now you mentioned that the movie was actually four episodes of the original series because in the opening credits, they actually show footage from Return of Jafar. Right. Uh, I, under I understand now. And you mentioned um, also like the series though, like uh, were you a fan of, of the, uh, the, t the animated series or even the third uh, movie, Aladdin and the King of Thieves? Oh yeah, they're all good. I, you know, I, I, uh, they're all they all they're all good and they all happen for different reasons when they happen I, i'm not in the king of thieves i don't think but i did watch it um yeah it's good you know i don't know they they created a couple really funny new characters like a be small and um Jason Alexander. <laughs> i don't know all of those you know they they're it was very clever and it, and it was it gave them a lot of um it gave them a lot of uh uh you know, extra energy and juice to keep writing other characters. I mean, I think that was pretty phenomenal. I still say this to this day, though, whenever there's something like that happens, though, and it's unfortunate luck for me, I always do, like, what you did in Aladdin, though, like, as, like, as Jafar, when you go, it's static. When you said the line, it's static. Whenever something doesn't go my way, I go, it's static, just like Jafar. <laughs> um, I, I gotta uh, gotta ask you too. You mentioned that you were on Broadway, and fortunately, I got to see you perform in this. Actually, I was in the fourth row when you performed uh, on February two thousand seventeen uh, in New York. Um, oh. How did you get to perform? Uh, how did you get the like? How did it come about? Like performing as Jafar once again. Well, uh, when when we started working on the movie in nineteen ninety one, there was there Disney theatrical didn't exist yet. It was, it was shortly, it was, it was a couple of years after that movie that Disney Theatrical actually was formed. And the first production that Disney Theatrical did on Broadway was Beauty and the Beast. And um, so when that happened, of course, you know, everybody that was in every other animated Disney movie thought, oh, great, maybe they'll do it, you know, because uh, many of the people that work on the films are also people that work on, um, you know, in the business and other on television and in film and on Broadway and and um, I guess you know from Disney's standpoint, it was just another way to experiment and see if they could have another wing of Disney, another leg of Disney, another arm of Disney. I don't even know what they how you how you define it. Um, you know, as another way of of um, of making money. I mean, you know. You know, originally Disney was just a few cartoons with a, a couple of mice in it, and then it expanded and expanded over time. I mean, that story is, you know, well documented um, at the Disney Family Museum, if no place else. And there are a lot of documentaries now about, you know, the beginning of the company. So, you know, it, it, it's something that happened over a long period of time in Disneyland and Disney World, and then you know, now there's Disney cruise ships and, the, you know, it just, it, it seems like uh, Disney, the empire, the happiest place on earth, the magic kingdom, <laughs> has, uh, you know, there's no end to the things that they could do. So when they decided to do, you know, uh, uh, produce, start producing on Broadway, 
it seemed logical, I guess, you know, and Beauty and the Beast was an enormous hit. And um, they just kept, they just kept doing it. It took a long time for them to get around to doing Aladdin because I think, you know, there's so much magic in the movie, first of all. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I think that the, you know, they needed all of the stars to align. They needed to make sure that they could get the right people directing and choreographing and designing it and et cetera, et cetera. It was a big commitment. I mean, they're all big commitments. Broadway shows are big commitments, but Aladdin turned out to be a very big commitment. Oh. I can't remember what it was capitalized at originally, but it was an enormous amount of money. And we first did a very small a pilot project about maybe 10 years before we started doing readings and it was just a lark they 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 were going to they were going to produce uh versions of aladdin so they could license it to schools and community groups and uh it was called aladdin junior or something i think but it was a way for them to be able to license the show and you know that's another that's another another form of another uh river of income for Disney, you know, through all these other uh, venues. So originally they were, you know, they were just doing it really exclusively for that, to license it. And uh, at the time I was doing Mary Poppins on Broadway and they came to me and I, and it was, Mary Poppins was in the new Amsterdam theater and the offices for Disney East coast are upstairs in the building. And they came to me one day and they said, you know, would you consider just coming in and reading your part, you know, with this, with this licensed version that we're working on, it would be such a lot of fun for, you know, Alan Menken will be there and blah, blah, blah. And I said, sure, I'd love to. Why, like, why would I say no? Well, you know, what's the downside? So uh, we started just doing readings around the ta around a table and then we started doing workshops. And then one day they decided, well, why don't we just do, let's, let's get it up on its feet kind of, and let's just see how people respond to it. And uh, Disney invited 50 people into the room or something like that. And at the time it was, you know, a lot of other, a lot of other music and songs from the film that had been cut and put back into the show. And, you know, it's a lot of that, it's a lot of backs, two steps forward, one step back. I see. And that's kind of how it happened, you know, it, and then all of a sudden they were like, hmm, this went very well, and maybe we should consider taking it further. And then there was a pilot project in Seattle, which was just to see if we, they could get the story to work on stage. There was not a lot of magic. I mean, there was magic, but it was very rudimentary stuff. It wasn't, it wasn't millions of dollars worth of magic tricks. And uh, it held up without millions of dollars of magic tricks and that's because it's, as we said before it's a great story you know at the core of at the core of the production there is this really really great story at the core of all the films there's a great story i mean even there's even a popeye and olive oil animation of them doing their version of of um aladdin and it's fantastic because it's a great story it's all about the story it really is about the story great plot <laughs> Yeah, I agree. So that's really how it that's 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 really what happened, you know, eventually they just got around to to doing it and I was still still felt that I was um able to do it and um uh you know. Hmm. So oh. that, that's how it happened. Okay. We uh, Nothing none of these things are ever planned. Isn't that weird? That's the weirdest thing about it. Just they happen. They 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 don't really materialize out of thin air, but they there's always a reason why and and how one thing leads to another and leads to another until finally, you know. Would spontaneous be the right word, Mr. Freeman? Which one? Would spontaneous be the right word? Since it just comes uh out of nowhere? Yeah, well, it, the right one. Okay. it doesn't really come out of nowhere. It's it's it is I mean a lot of it is spontaneous, but it's it's because somebody has an idea usually, I guess, and they say, why don't we just, why don't we just try to write this and see if we can figure out a way to make it work? And then somebody says, this story really works and maybe we can figure out a way to get the right people to come help us do the magic to do it on stage. And, you know, that, that's, yeah, but again, it's just, 
I guess, I suppose spontaneous, I, guess, I suppose some of it is spontaneous, huh. but it, I, I, I don't know, it's, it's mysterious. It's, it's like alchemy, you know, <laughs> theater <laughs> especially is like alchemy. You know, you, you can, you can have a great script, you have great actors, you can have great music, you can have great costumes, great, and it can still be a flop. Oh boy. Yeah. So you just never know. So you have all of these great things and then something happens and it's just something that happens in the ether. And it's, it's kind of, it's not really magic, but it's kind of like alchemy. It's just like everything is, everything sort of comes together and it, yeah. and, it and then it, it just, you're like, oh, I think we have something here. Something out of the blue. Yeah. Sweet. Uh, oh yeah, I had a question, didn't I? Did it oh yeah. Um, you know the part where uh, Jafar got his second wish when he became a sorceress, right? When he becomes a sorcerer? Yeah. Yeah, and he did that maniacal laugh and his shadow just goes over Jasmine and the Sultan. How did you manage to put so much raw emotion in that mechanical, I mean, maniacal laugh? You know, as the lightning You were right the first time, it's just mechanical. It's really mechanical. I mean, you you uh it, you know it's a technical thing you just have to i mean i there were times when i would be in the studio and they'd say okay we need a 10 second laugh we need a 15 second laugh we need a 20 second laugh okay just keep laughing until you can't laugh anymore you know we need you know we need we need a, a we need a snicker that builds into a maniacal laugh you know and, and that moment in the movie is that's that's like that's right at the moment where I always say he finally snaps. He has a psychotic break and, you know, goes around the twist, as they say, and, and something happens. And at that moment, you know, all bets are off. I don't know how I did it. I just did it, you know. You just, it was probably, it was probably the prompting and the prodding of, of Ron and John. <laughs> <laughs> give us something else give us more you know because there's all kinds of laughs and there's all kinds of you know there's like there's funny laughter and happy laughter and there's terrifying laughter and there you know it's just it's i guess it's just what the moment called for and i don't even know i don't i don't know i, I don't know i it just it just it happens you know oh, okay I see. Know. all right and of course, of course, Mr. Freeman, you reprised your role as Jafar in the Hercules animated series in the 1999 episode Hercules and the Arabian Nights. Memories of shooting on Hercules and working with James Woods and Bobcat Goldthwait. Well, everyone asks me that, and I didn't work with any of them because we were all in, we all, at that time, you know, we were all on different schedules. Everybody had a different, was in a different city or different schedule. So see, by that time, uh, by the time all that came around, you know, you could be, you could be in your, in your kitchen and, you know, practically and record. I mean, no one has to be anywhere anymore. It's kind of, I have to say, it's not as much fun as when, you know, everyone used to be around and when you had to be in the same room at the same time, or at least, you know, for, for certain aspects of it. I mean, now it's, it, it's very, um, it's just all mechanical. I mean, nothing is, rarely are you in the same studio with someone that you record with these days. I just started work on this new series last year called um, uh, Hell of a Boss. It's, a, it's a, a strange online, very edgy series. Uh, you find it on YouTube, and I just my character just started in the in the first scene of the second season. Two characters I did for them, and uh, I was just in a studio by myself. And the same thing with Hercules. You know, we were all in different places, and then they just, you know, somebody gets on the thing, they just mix it together. Hmm. I see. And of course, um, we have a couple more questions before we wrap up, sir. Um, sure. And what I've always wanted to know as a little boy, because I watched this episode of MTV Celebrity Deathmatch. You are in the credits for one episode playing Satan in the episode Fandemonium, which aired February 2001. Memories of shooting the uh, MTV Celebrity Deathmatch, which I believe was Claymation. What was it called? Uh, it was called MTV Celebrity Deathmatch. In the credits, they had Jonathan Freeman playing uh, Satan. I was wondering if this was you or not, if you could confirm that this was you. I can't even remember that. It could be. I, I don't, 
I don't know. Somebody. Um, what was the name of the show again? Oh, uh, MTV's uh, Celebrity Deathmatch. It was a claymation show. I have no, I, I honestly have no idea. I mean, is it, does it sound like me? It, it sounds like Jafar when he's a genie form, when he has that booming, like, demonic uh, voice. I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. That, it doesn't ring a bell, but um, there have been so many thing, little, you know, small things that, I, that I've done, too. I, 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 was on a, I was on several other cartoon series. Uh, Timo Supremo? Timo Supremo, that was one. Um, I did the series of Lilo and Stitch at one point. I can't remember the characters, something like Dr. Sonambula or something. And, or maybe that was- Hamster Veal? Isn't it Hamster Veal? Was it what? Wasn't it? Wait, wait, wait. I know a few characters from Lilo and Stitch. I haven't watched it for a oh, few Oh, there's years. also something called, wait, Timo Supremo. Lilo and Doctor, Stitch. Dr. Jacques Vaughn Hamsterville. He's like a hamster. He has a red cape and he has a H on it. I don't know. Ah, okay. I don't know. Uh, well, of course, um, you were also, you, you were Tito Swing in Shining Times, weren't you? Yes, I did that for, yeah, I'm a puppeteer, um, also by training. And um, I, I worked with a company called Flexitune. Uh, and... Uh, that was a show that started in the UK, Thomas the Tank Engine, it was very popular. Yeah. And um, one of our producers, a British producer, who I believe it was producing it in London, teamed up with another producer here, and they created a bigger story around Thomas the Tank Engine that took place actually in a train station. And in the train station, and this is the weirdest, this is like one of the weirdest things ever. And I, it, it's so interesting that, the characters in the jukebox, there's a jukebox in the station, an actual jukebox in Shining in the station. And people, customers that were, you know, getting on trains or coming to meet people or whatever, they would sometimes, you know, they take a nickel out of their out of their bag or their pocket or something, they put it into the into the um, jukebox, and then there would be a a, a jump cut to the interior of the jukebox, which of course wasn't really the interior of the jukebox, but it was something that was made to look like the in, what the interior of the jukebox might look like if there were actually people living in there who played music. Oh, oh right. It, it's completely, it was such a completely crazy idea. And, and when I read it, I was like, this is so weird. Kids are gonna get flipped up but, but they loved it it was a huge success um it's still playing somewhere most of the time and when we started there were, there was one magic character on the show whose name was the who was the station master mr station master and it was played by ringo star and ringo did it for about half of the series maybe and then george carlin took over the character at another point ringo had to go on some you know in the story, the character of, of Mr. Station Master was going somewhere, but he was sending his cousin to take over <laughs> as Station Master. It was just so crazy, but that's how series are, you know, if you stick with them long enough, they get they can be completely loony. But the in, but the but the fact that there were these, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, five characters that lived in the jukebox. My character, Tito Swing, played the piano. Grace was a bass player. Uh, the Boy Brothers played um, one guitar, I think. They played, one, one of the brothers played the fret and the other played the, I don't know. It was, it was bizarre. And then there was a, a girl drummer named Dee Dee. <laughs> and, and they lived inside the jukebox. And all I did, they live inside the jukebox and play music. They could get on an elevator and go down one level to where they had their kitchen and go down another level to where they slept. Oh. Oh. If you go back and look at them, look at any of those episodes, you won't believe it. You'll just be like, how did they ever, who could have possibly thought of this? It was just, it was bizarre, but we all loved it. We worked on it for, uh, I think six seasons, six years or seven years. We shot it in Canada at the Scarborough Studios. And because of all of our stuff that was in the jukebox, we could shoot an entire season's worth of stuff in a couple of months. 
and it was a ball. We had a, we just had a blast. And um, so the, the people that I worked with there too, I mean, they were all brilliant puppeteers and um, that, was a, that was a great time. Cool. I said, there are a lot of kids who remember that who are huge aficionados of, of um, not just Tito, but Jafar, you know? And, and what's interesting is that I find myself with this weird vortex because a lot of kids on the spectrum, those characters were, have been, become very important to them. And um, I have a huge, a huge following of these kids on the spectrum. And I got very involved with um, the autism community at one point. And there was a, a great book called Life Animated that was written by Sa Ron Suskind about his son, Owen, who taught himself how to, who fell into uh, autism at the age of three and uh, was normal developing and taught himself how to rejoin the world and by watching Disney animated movies. So he is a complete of his, he knows, he knows everything about Disney movies. Anyway, it turns out that there's an enormous amount of kids on the spectrum who are very committed to Disney movies and also to this, to Shining Time Station. It, it, it's a very, I've had a very unusual, a very a, a entirely enjoyable and lovely career, but it's very unusual at times. And that's one of the things that's been completely enlightening. I mean, I, I oh, there's also a great um, documentary you should look at called Life Animated that I'm in with Gilbert. Um, and uh, we got, we were, that, that film was nominated for an Academy Award that year. Oh, very cool. And of course, yeah. we have, we have uh, three minutes less, of course, uh, oh to wrap up. And I got to ask Mr. Freeman, because Kwame and I always had, we always showed fear towards Jafar. But there are some that actually don't fear him, like my friend Catherine and my fiance Mel. Could you please, in a, like, can you please, as Jafar, in a very threatening way, show some fear and strike some intimidation towards I couldn't possibly. I think it's wonderful because... The whole thing about playing a vil about playing these villains, I mean, I think the secret to them is to make people love to hate you. I mean, just just making people hate you and scaring them is is really not enough. It's it it is a it is something that is really a um, it's really a it's really a trick. So your friends have really keyed into the deliciousness of those characters and. Um, Maybe they should try being. Uh, they should try doing um, some villain characters. They'd probably be very good at it. It's a. It's sort of. A, it's not really a secret, but oh. if you look at if you look at all of the great Disney villains, uh, most of the great villains. Period. Usually, they're so delicious that people end up loving to hate them. That's uh, right, uh, Mr. Freeman. Uh, <laughs> as a as a request, though, like from my fiance and Catherine, because they love your work. They think like like me. They think you're one of the greatest villains of all time, and. I've I've said that since I was two years old. Would you be able to threaten my, uh, Catherine and Melissa as Jafar? I know this is gonna sound weird, but would you, as Jafar, do that? I couldn't possibly threaten them. I could say my most abject and humble thanks, Catherine. My most abject and humble thanks. Who was the other person? <laughs> That's all. <laughs> and oh, can I? Yeah, go ahead, Bob. Other person. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and um. Besides Catherine, who is it? Uh, my fiance, Melissa. Melissa, my most abject and humble thanks, Melissa. Melissa and Catherine for <laughs> not being afraid. Final one. Bami, any final thoughts, man, before we wrap up? Yeah, and also, um, before we wrap this up, I promised my uh, girlfriend a shout out. Gia Melody and Hedgehog, triple seven one. She um, wanted to say hi to you. And do you mind doing your voice? Her name's my girlfriend. Her name is Gia. <laughs> yeah, it's, a pleasure. it's been a great pleasure meeting your Kwame. <laughs> and be before we go, Mr. Freeman, I want to say thank you for not only this amazing interview, thank you for making me feel like that two-year-old boy again because you have that incredible power to do that. I, I always said mm -hmm. that you are not in 1992, you were became the most powerful sorceress in the world and the most powerful mortal genie. In 2022, you are not only a Disney legend, but you are also, in my opinion, the greatest Disney villain of all time. And you always will be. And you always will be. And I'm going to conclude with the following. And this is something that you absolutely deserve, Mr. Freeman. And Kwame, you can join me on this too. And that is thank you, Freeman. <laughs> thank you, Freeman.
Pleasure. It was a pleasure to have you here, sir. And honestly, you inspire me to do more voice acting. I do voice act too. Oh, do it. It's okay. wonderful. It's a, yeah. it's a great, it's a great job. I love doing voice yeah. actors. I do villains too, man. Thank you so much, Mr. Freeman. You are an absolute inspiration to not just me, but to Kwame and many Disney fans. It's and a great I pleasure. Have mm -hmm. a good day, sir. <laughs> Thank you for your kind words. Have Thank a good you. day. Have a good day. See you, man. Bye-bye. Farewell. To honor.